Good morning, everyone. Today is Sunday, February 27th, 2022, and we welcome you this morning to the virtual Sunday School of the Mount Nebo Baptist Church. To our Facebook friends and to our Zoom family and all of our invited friends and guests, we welcome you this morning. Our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Johnny Green, Jr. Reverend Sandra Baker is our executive minister and director of Christian education. Minister Michael Evans is the superintendent of our Sunday school and I am Dolores Cooper, the assistant Sunday school superintendent. And we say welcome this morning. We begin with our student devotion coming from class number three, where our teachers are Walking Deacon Kenneth Jones, Minister Maya Clark, and Elder Mark Young. We begin with our morning song from Brother Rudy Holland, our scripture, Nurse Shirley Reimer, and our prayer from Sister Erin Valentine, please. The love of God guides me along my way. The love of God will never let me stray. The love of God will be there for the love of God is every is everywhere. 
Yeah, the love of God makes me know when I am right. The love of God makes me know when I'm wrong. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. The love of God will be there for me. The love of God is everything, is everywhere. Yeah, the love of God makes me know when I'm right. Thank you, Jesus. The love of God lets me know when I'm wrong. Yes, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know the love of God will be there for him. The love of God is every, is everywhere. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Mount Nebo family and friends. I'll be reading 1 Peter 2 and 9, and it says such. But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth thy the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for waking us up this morning and Lord for waking us up in our right minds. We thank you for providing and protecting us all. We thank you for this Sunday and for seeing us through another week. We thank you, dear God, for a wonderful group that is gathered this morning to study your word. We ask that you be in our midst as we discuss the lessons today. We ask, dear God, that you help and guide the teachers this morning as they teach and discuss the lesson with us today. And Lord, help us to listen and retain what we hear and learn today so we can use it in our everyday lives. We thank you for Mount Nebo, dear God. Bless Mount Nebo. We thank you for the leaders of Mount Nebo. And we thank you that we are able to continue Sunday school and service remotely. First, we thank you for our leader, Pastor Green, the Reverend Johnny Melvin Green. Please bless Pastor Green and his family as he leads the Mount Nebo family. Bless Reverend Baker, our Christian education teacher and her family. Bless Reverend Johnson and her family. Bless all the ministers and all the other ministries. Bless all members and their families, dear Lord. Please bless us all. Dear God, please help us to be more like you and to be more loving to each other and to be more forgiving as we come to you and ask you to forgive us. Help us to be more forgiven as we seek your forgiveness. Dear God, we need your help more than ever, especially right now amidst the global turmoil. We pray for peace and health for all people of the world. We especially pray this morning for the people of Ukraine at this time. Only you can help and protect them at this time. And Lord, we want to thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed on us. We love you, dear Lord. We give you all the honor and praise and glory in your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. We thank God on this morning. And now we begin with our Black History presentation. 
Our theme is Reclaiming Our Royalty. And we begin with our youth reflections this morning. And we will hear a presentation from Master Jaden Freeman, who will present The Road to Freedom. Jaden is from our Children and Kingdom Kids. And at this time, we will hear from Jaden Freeman, followed by Miss Jewel Davis, The Hill We Climb from our youth and young adult segment. Master Jaden. Good morning. Hi, my name is Jaden and I am a kingdom kid. Martin Luther King Jr. gave the I Have a Dream speech on August 28, 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. He gave the speech to help people see how badly black people were being treated. He gave the speech because he wanted black people to have the same freedom as everyone else. He wanted black people to be free, to eat where they wanted, go to school where they wanted, and sit wherever they wanted when they rode the bus or train. He even wanted the black and white children to be able to play together. I was not born when Martin Luther King Jr. gave this speech, but I can do many of the things he was fighting for. I go to school with children of different races. I can sit in the front of the bus. I can eat anywhere my family takes me, but I can also see from all the killings of black people in the last few years that some things have not changed since he gave that speech. Black people are still being treated badly and different because of their skin color. Cops kill black people and other people kill black people. I pray that this will stop one day. I read this, this speech with my mom and I want to share with you the part of the speech that stands out to me. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. It has been a, a lot of years since he gave that speech. I look at how things are today and it makes me feel like some of his dream did not come true because black people are still treated different because of, because of their skin color. I believe that Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream will come true one day. We still live in some bad times, but I believe that things will get better. It's hard sometimes, but I believe God will make things better. We have to believe that things will get better. There are people who suffered through hard times in the Bible, but God helped them. I believe God will help us too. Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher like Pastor Green. Pastor Green tells us to pray. Our Sunday school teachers tell us to pray. I like to pray. I believe praying helps us to get through hard times to not hate people who treat us bad, and it helps us trust God. I think Martin Luther King Jr. prayed a lot because he didn't hate the people who treated Black people bad, and he went through some hard times. He just wanted things to get better. If he prayed, I believe he trusted God. I want things. I want things to get better. I want Martin Luther King Jr.'s dreams to come true. I believe that the only way we can make this dream come true is to pray. If God can help Moses and the children of Israel cross the Red Sea, I believe he can help you and me. I have a dream too. One day, things will get better with God's help. Amen. Jewel. Yep. Hi, my name is Jewel. I'm in the youth and young adults. And in Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, I would say my favorite part is when she said, and I quote, for there is always light if we are brave enough to see it, end quote. I feel like this part connects a lot to real world problems right now, like the pandemic. It's always so easy to see the bad in things, and yet sometimes so hard to see the good. COVID killed many people and lots of people's loved ones. It also made people very sick, but we're in a better place than we were in 2020. Even though people are still getting sick, there are less people dying. 
COVID wasn't all bad, at least for me it wasn't. Besides the burden of online school and having to stay home, I was able to do a lot of things, like spend time with my mom, start learning another language, and really getting to better understand myself. I also feel like this quote is connected to confidence and risk taking. I, I know that I've been presented with opportunities to do great things, but I didn't because I was scared that I was going to fail. So if you're brave enough to see the light, you'll grow. It also reminds me of the song, This Little Light of Mine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. No, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of our presenters from our children and youth department. Thank you, thank you so much. At this time, we will move to the next segment of our Black History presentation, Reclaiming Our Royalty. It is with great honor that I present to you our moderator for the next segment of our program. She is first of all, a daughter of God. She follows in the footstep of Christ by living her life in service to others. She is a woman of action. We have witnessed her work for that which is right, fair, and just. We are doubly honored this morning to say that she is our beloved sister, a member of the Mount Nebo Baptist Church under the leadership of our pastor, Dr. Johnny M. Green. We present to you at this time, the moderator for a conversation with our black leaders, Senator Cordell Clear. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, Mount Nebo. To God be the glory, uh, giving honor to God who is the head of my life and uh, to uh, my pastor, Dr. Donnie Melvin Green and First Lady Green. Um, to God be the glory. It's just an honor to be here this morning. And I wanna thank all of my colleagues who join us this morning for Sunday school. And I just have to say how moved I am by Master Jaden and Jewel. Um, your presentations were just so uh, inspiring. Uh, and what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful job you did. So I have the task this morning of bringing the conversation with our black leaders about reclaiming our royalty. Um, as we heard in the scripture, first Peter tells us we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and that we are. And in par as part of reclaiming our royalty, we have to reclaim our communities uh, and we have to reclaim the black family. We have to become stronger. So I'm joined here by some really powerful people here today uh, who are going to talk to us a little bit about how we reclaim our community and reclaim our families, uh, in essence, reclaiming our royalty and how we get back uh, to where we need to be. So I'm not gonna uh, delay because I know time is limited and I'm going to start by introducing uh, a young man. Uh, he is the former Senator who sat in this seat um, and was elevated to Lieutenant Governor of New York State. And his name is Brian Benjamin, and he's here today. And I wanna ask him to just speak to us a little bit about how we protect our community. Uh, environmentally, there are a lot of hazards that are in our communities and what steps that we are taking to make sure that our communities are protected from hazardous conditions in the community and uh, how we're gonna be able to repair the damage that has been done. So first of all, thank you Mount Nebo for having this uh, Black History Month uh, celebration, talking about reclaiming our royalty. There's nothing uh, that is more uh, appropriate to be talking about in this moment than how we reclaim our royalty. And I wanna thank our Senator Cordell Clear for her leadership uh, and continuing to fight uh, for, for black people everywhere. Uh, I see I'm uh, joined by Senator Robert Jackson, our new assembly member, Robert Gibbs, 
uh, Assembly Member Al Taylor, uh, Assembly Member Inez Dickens, and, and so many others. Thank you so much. And to, to our pastor, uh, uh, Reverend Johnny Green, thank you for all of your leadership on behalf of Black people everywhere. You know, uh, let me start by this, saying this. You know, in 1962, uh, when New York City planners first proposed a sewage treatment plant for the residents and businesses of Manhattan's west side, they initially picked a spot on the Hudson River around 72nd Street. Uh, the neighborhood, however, was well on its way to increasing its political might and power, and they decided that they didn't want the uh, waste of the sewage treatment plant on the Upper West Side, and that uh, sewage uh, plant was then relocated to Harlem uh, on our west side on the, on the Hudson River, and that uh, is, is part of a, a story of historically our community being the dumping grounds for all of the sewage plants that are not designed elsewhere, uh, methadone clinics, any kind of treatment facilities that the, that the city needs but does not want to deal with the externalities of has been placed in our communities. And as a result, uh, we have uh, been a community that has been, that has asthma at a rate uh, twice of white Americans and so many other hazards. And so one of the things that when we talk about the fact that we have so much black leadership now across the state, um, particularly in our own communities, is we now have the power to fight back. And so as we are uh, proposing and coming forward with this new budget, uh, Senator Clear, which you are a part of, we're fighting for things like spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that all of our schools um, are, you know, are, are part of this new green economy where we are, are, are having the best uh, sort of uh, uh, materials um, and, and any renovations uh, that are happening in our schools are done in a way that are, that, are, that are friendly to the environment. As we are talking about moving towards uh, renewable energy, uh, powering our electricity uh, uh, part of, as part of the CLCPA, we want to make sure that our community is, is being sort of taken care of for the, the bad that has happened to us in the past. Uh, and so we are investing the resources and the time to ensure that that occurs. And so, you know, we, we, we're going to continue to do that, um, Senator Clear. And also we're going to make sure that as we transition to this new green economy and make sure that our community is not ravaged by some of the decisions that we made in the past, that our community gets the jobs and the opportunities that come along with building wind turbines and uh, making sure that we are putting solar panels on rooftops. As we put solar panels on rooftops and public housing in our district, and by the way, this district, the 32nd, has the most public housing of any district in the state, we need to make sure that as we're doing that and we're, and, and we're creating a better um, environment uh, from a health perspective for our own residents, that there's also the economic opportunity for the kids in our communities, the, 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 uh, the families go to our churches, for the small businesses that power our communities. We have to make sure that we're doing all those at the same time. That's part of what I'm looking to lead, working with all of you in this budget. And when we do that, we can, we can say that we're actually doing everything that we can as the present political leadership to help reclaim our royalty. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor, talking about environmental health and economic health as well. Thank you for that. Um, next, we're going to uh, hear from a, a young, a, another young man who I have uh, followed. We were school board members. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm trying to. Yeah, something came up on my screen, I'm sorry. Uh, this, this young man, he walked miles and miles and miles uh, for our children. And I just wanted uh, our Senator Robert Jackson, who is our neighboring Senator uh, in West Harlem uh, in, uh, and up in, up, up in Washington Heights as well. I want him to just talk to us about, you know, the new deal for CUNY will transform the university system and be of national significance. What benefits will the black community see through the transformation of this instrumental university system. And if you could talk a little bit about the justice that we're trying to bring through education. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, Cordell Clear for inviting me to come in and to Pastor Green. Uh, thank you for allowing this beautiful program to come forward, understanding that the more education we receive, 
about, in, about coming together and speaking about the issues and concerns of our community and educating uh, everyone so that you're fully aware of everything that's happening in your life. And obviously, uh, God, Allah is the one that uh, allows us to do that. So the, this bill here, this is a bill uh, about CUNY. Uh, CUNY, if you don't know, is the City Universities of New York. And basically CUNY is in only in New York City. We have SUNY, which is part of the State University of New York. And, but this one is called the SUNY New Deal. What's the New Deal about it? Why is such a New Deal? Well, it's a new deal because uh, back prior to 1976, CUNY was free. Um, all you had to do was graduate from high school. And then if you applied to college, it was free in New York City. So what happened? You asked, especially the young people, how come it's not free now? Well, uh, we ran into a financial crisis in 1975, uh, 76. And the administration at that time, uh, and I can't tell you whether it was a city administration or the state administration, basically eliminated uh, the free tuition. And the, the New Deal for CUNY, and I got this off some literature, mandates that all tuition and fees for in-state undergrads uh, with specific timeframes for degree completion by uh, eliminating uh, uh, tuition. And so there were requirements that you had to fulfill, obviously, uh, but that's what it was. And now people said, wait a minute, CUNY was free back then. And now in the 70s, when more people of color was coming into CUNY, all of a sudden uh, it's not free. And so we're trying to get back to where education is free, meaning it's being supported by the entire government, both the state government and the city government. And that's what this is about. I've said many, many times, education is the key to uplift all families. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, green, or blue, or whether you're rich or you're poor, that's education. And so Cordell um, mentioned that, uh, I don't know if she mentioned, I filed a lawsuit, many of you may know, uh, way back, uh, and walked 150 miles to Albany. It took 13 years of litigation to win, but the bottom line of that court action was um, that billions of dollars uh, were put into the system in New York City and New York State in order to provide the opportunity for our children to receive that education. So it doesn't only start at CUNY at the uh, college level, but it starts at home. And the family is so important in the infrastructure, just like God and, and teaching, like the master and the other young uh, uh, member of your church spoke. Uh, they did, they were beautiful, their presentation and everything. So we're trying to get back to where tuition is free and it's gonna cost. It's gonna cost uh, uh, hundreds of millions and probably a couple of billions of dollars. But is it worth it? Of course it is. Uh, just like parents struggle, to make sure that their children go to get education. You've heard the saying, especially those that have been around, we want our children to go beyond what we have achieved so that they can set the groundwork uh, for their children to get an excellent education and, do, and then be the type of adult we want them to be, respectful, family oriented, and uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers, police officers, scientists, uh, firefighters, government workers, investigators, mechanics, all of the things that make this world work. So that's what uh, the CUNY New Deal is about. We're trying to get there. And uh, Andrew Gennardis, who is a state senator from Brooklyn, his mother was an educator. He is the primary sponsor on this, but I, along with the caucus, when I say the caucus, the Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, Asian caucus, that is a caucus up in Albany in which all of us come together and speak about the issues and concerns that impact people of color. So the Thank CUNY you. New Deal is what we're trying to see. How can we get there? I ask all of you and I, uh, to reach out to your elected public officials, uh, educate your uh, brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your mother, your father, 
all of your relatives how important it is that we get a good education. And this is one of the avenues that will open the door. But right now, you have to pay. And many people in our community, based on the family income we have, cannot afford it. Uh, they take out loans uh, and they get in debt, but getting in debt to get a good education is something that we have to do, but we need to get there faster and sooner and open it up to everyone so everyone will have the opportunity for good quality education. And finally, um, graduating from high school, let me tell you what the highest court in the lawsuit, the campaign for fiscal equity that we filed. The highest court said that every student should graduate from high school knowing how to read, knowing how to write, knowing how to serve on a jury and being able to hold competitive employment. That's the minimum standard of education that we need to receive. So thank we'll you, stop with that, I'll stop Cordell. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that excellent uh, education on the New Deal and uh, educational justice. Next, we're gonna hear from the uh, we call him Reverend Al sometime, but he is our Assemblyman Al Taylor. Uh, and we're going to talk about, oh, um, I'm sorry, I skipped, I skipped, I'm going a little too fast. Assemblywoman Inez Dickens, uh, good morning, I'm sorry. We're gonna speak to Assemblywoman Inez Dickens and I have a question for her. Uh, I'd like for her to talk about the vision for voting rights in the black community in New York. Uh, and the gaps of equal access to the polls. Um, and uh, so without any, any uh, more delay, I'd like to hear from Assemblywoman Dickens. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. And um, protocol having been established, um, I recognize the um, esteemed pastor of this uh, congregation, House of God, uh, Reverend Dr. Johnny Green and Mrs. Green, and I bring greetings from my church, um, Mount uh, Zion Baptist, and my minister, Reverend and Mrs. Carl L. Washington. Uh, good morning all to the family, and thank you, um, Senator, for, for giving us all this opportunity. But I want to just talk about the youth for just a second, because I want to thank Jaden and Jewel for what they did this morning. It was fantastic. And to see and recognize uh, what they're doing is very important because we've got to uplift our youth, they're our future. And so I just wanted to mention them and, and to thank uh, Dolores for taking the lead in, in, in working with our young. Sister Dolores, you've done a magnificent job and thank you for what you've done. All right, now voting, let's get on to the voting. Um, there, there's been some, hello, Lieutenant Governor, how are you? <laughs> and to my colleagues, all of my colleagues, uh, including Reverend Al, as, as, as the Senator said, and, and we have a new uh, assembly member, um, Eddie Gibbs, that has joined us. But the, the voting is critical. And for some reason, people of color, Black people, because that's what I'm dealing with really today, Black and brown people um, have become fearful, and I guess maybe from the time of, of, of slavery, I don't know, when they didn't allow us, when you had to have own property in order to vote. Uh, but now, um, and in New York, by the way, up until the 60s, you had to take a test, a written test. That was here in New York City, I'm talking about, where you had to take a test in order to uh, a vote. You didn't have to own property, but up until the 60s, through the 60s, you had to be able to, to pass a test that asked you what was Amendment 12 of the Constitution. Well, who knew that? And so, you, you know, it was a difficult test so that you could not, uh, you know, you, you, you couldn't, it was made it difficult for us to pass. Finally, that was eradicated off the books, thank God, but they have found other ways. One of the things that's going on, and it's a result of the pandemic, uh, we have early voting. We have also um, uh, voting by mail um, or on a computer, you can now vote. But I'm fearful about one part of this that's being advocated. And that is uh, that, that voting the same day as you register. And my fear of that is that it can be used at a 
as a voter suppression tool. Because if you think about it, it's very hard for black electeds to continue to get elected as our communities change um, and, and more and more diversity moves in. And if that happens and a, a person can bring in your, an opponent, not of this community, uh, can bring in busloads of people, disseminate them amongst the, the poll sites and register and vote and, and effectuate a, a, a change in the election so that a person that we from this community like, know, and want to get elected loses the election. It's voter fraud. And I'm very fearful about voter fraud. And I have not supported same day registration for that very reason. It sounds like it's reasonable. It sounds like it's a great idea, but it opens the door for voter fraud and suppression. So it's important that we read and understand what's put before us so that we don't always support something that sounds good on the face of it, but that, that we understand what it means and the impact it can have upon our communities. Because once they can affect the change in the voting pattern, it means that, that I wouldn't get elected. Cordell Clare wouldn't get elected. Uh, 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 Brian Benjamin couldn't be Lieutenant Governor. The, a lot could happen if, if that happens. And I'm very fearful about this. I wanted everyone to understand about my fear when it comes to um, that particular bill that, that is being pushed. And I understand the reason for it. However, I am very much against it because I'm afraid it, it hasn't shown me where it, it will not keep the door closed to voter suppression. So I have been advocating not passing it. Um, there were members of the city council um, who also advocated not to pass it. Uh, for the very same reason, the, uh, the fear of voter suppression and, and uh, affecting changes that we do not want. So, um, Senator, I'm very happy that you asked me about that uh, because that's important. And it's important that we have uh, be able to vote by mail because sometimes our, senator, our seniors cannot get out in the, in, and, and vote. Sometimes these polling sites are located in very obscure places that is difficult. And because public safety has become an issue, sometimes people don't want to go to certain sites. So uh, it, it's important that we do have it by mail, but at the same time, we have to invest resources in the Board of, of Elections in order for them to do proper education, in order for them to be properly educated themselves as employees, as well as educate the public in, in how to vote and how to use the paper ballot and whether it, you have to send for it every year or, or not. So I, I thank you for giving me that opportunity because I, that's something I would like to share uh, with um, my family, this community, um, because of my fear. Um, I love Harlem. I've always been, I was born and raised here. So it's very important to me that we protect Harlem um, as much as we possibly can. And that's the responsibility of all of us elected. God bless. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective on same day voting. Uh, Assemblymember Dickens. Next, we will hear from our Assemblyman and Reverend Al Taylor. Uh, and we want to talk about the benefits of public banking um, and infrastructure dollars. How, how can those infrastructure dollars help our community? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, so my grandma would say I'm happy, glad to be here this morning. Um, certainly, we thank you for allowing this opportunity, Pastor Green. Uh, I see so many wonderful faces. I see Reverend Johnson. Um, thank you all. This is exciting. And thank you, uh, Master Jaden and uh, Miss Jewel for your presentation this morning. It, just reminds us, and sometimes we do need to be reminded, so thank you. Um, and my colleagues in government, uh, the infrastructure dollars that are on the federal level that have been talked about, the surpluses that are there, 
um, can do so many wonderful things. They're a combination of things. I'm going to try to zero in right here and just talk about the infrastructure dollars. Infrastructure dollars. We need those type of dollars to not only um, be made available statewide, but when you look at your communities in which we currently live here in Harlem, um, Polo Ground Public Housing is a place where it used to be the arena for uh, baseball. Everybody's aware of that for the most part. But if you're utilizing that subway, it's almost two to three flights below ground. So someone with a cane or disabled has an issue trying to get up those stairs. What can we do with infrastructure money? I'm glad you asked, uh, Senator Cordell. We can put elevators and escalators right there with that money because I guarantee you, nickel subpoena us, if this were another community, we wouldn't have to lobby for this. We wouldn't have to ask for it. It would already be on the board. So we're saying those thousands of residents that are right there need access to public transportation. And it's not something that we're asking. We, we're demanding that. So we are working on that. And I thank you for that conversation. Um, let's look around and see what else we could do. Uh, if you're familiar with the Espinar Gardens community, there's a seawall over there that's in dire need of repair. 10 years ago, when Hurricane Sandy hit, the cars in the parking lot floated like toys in a tub. We can do better with the infrastructure money. So money is important. And let's also talk about our own ability to save, our own ability to create credit in our communities. And I think these are economic engines that will actually drive. There's so many things that can happen north of 125th Street or north of 110th Street. It doesn't have to be restaurant role. It can be real skillful jobs that our children do not have to leave this great state just to get another job somewhere. Right in their community, they can earn living wages that will also set them up for what I call generational wealth. So we're players and we're not waiting at the table as the beggar trying to get whatever. We have an opportunity. And I think also as legislators and my colleagues, I am from Harlem. I grew up in Harlem. I was raised in North Carolina, but I grew up here, PS 123, 140th. I went to PS 28 over on 168th Street and Broadway. My mother and some of her family went to Stitt. So we've always been here. And Edgecombe Correctional Facility was a hospital that my sister was born in. So I remember those days and I'm saying that as children of God, as ministers of the gospel, and as leaders, we have something what they call dudamus. It's dudamus is the Greek word for power. And it's not only power, but it's the authority to walk in and act in that power. So we've been invested with power because of your vote. And God has given us a power. And we want to exercise it with freedom and no fearfulness about bringing home the resources that are going to maintain our communities so that it doesn't look like a place we used to know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Al. I really appreciate that. And um, thank you for that education on what these infrastructure dollars can mean in our community. Uh, thank you so much. Assembly Member Gibbs, you are new, our newest member. Welcome. Uh, you're a freshman like myself uh, as well. I thank you. But um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about uh, your contains much of the public housing in East Harlem. I want to know why must we fight to realize the goals of protecting public housing and also uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, legislation related to reparations, whichever one you want to share with us this morning. I think you're mute. You're muted. Okay. Unmute yourself. Do you hear me now? Yes. Morning, thank for me this morning. Pleasure uh, joining us. Uh, reforms were established to the great pastor, uh, Reverend Dr. Johnny Green, uh, to the whole entire Mount Nebo family. Uh, to my church, the uh, First Shabbat Baptist Church, and Reverend Pastor Weir, and the entire family. Uh, it's just a pleasure being here this morning. Uh, I don't know, I think it's freezing over here on my end. Can you hear me now, Senator? Yeah, Eddie, I think you should turn off your uh, your video and you would get a better transmission. 
Okay, great, great. I turn on ready. Let's try that now. How about that? How's that better? Yes. Yeah. Well, so uh, just real briefly, uh, thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, Look, I barely knew in the assembly one month. Uh, and so I thank you for bringing this question forward because it gave me the ability and the inspiration to research the bill and the reparation bill, which is A30808, uh, which was carried by uh, then assembly member Charles Barron in 2019 and 2020. However, you know, it sat dormant for a year or so. And <clears throat> in 2021 and 2022, it was advanced through the assembly, passed, now it sits dormant in the uh, Senate. So we're just waiting for the Senate to pass the bill. But I do want to state that, you know, reparations, you know, this, this particular bill establishes the New York Community Commission's or reparations remedies and makes an appropriations of $250,000. Now, this commission will be responsible for, you know, determining, you know, all the effects of slavery and such. Um, my take on it is like, like, yes, during Black History Month, yes, we talk about our history, but we also thinking about the effects of that history, right? Like slavery on our community today, uh, the effects of systemic issues that relate to the race in our nation still exist today, uh, Senator. Uh, it's our job to examine those issues and the effects and appropriately uh, level the playing field. Uh, leveling the playing field sometimes means economic assistance for the people of color who have been traditionally left behind, like us here in NYCHA. Uh, we are thinking about, we are not only thinking about the past, but what needs to be done to achieve justice and equality for our communities in NYCHA in the future. Uh, so this particular bill, bringing light to it, uh, I'm going to do some more research on it. I see that we have so many wonderful co-sponsors some who are on the uh, stream live today. And so, yeah, reparations is very important to NYCHA and to this East Harlem community. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Assemblymember Gibbs. I wanna thank all of today's guests and participants who have helped us understand how we are all fighting to reclaim our royalty, to repair our communities, to uplift the black family. All of these things that we discussed here today are important. Uh, this is just a snapshot. This is hardly uh, all of the work that, that uh, we are doing every day or even that is required because as we talk about uh, the effects of slavery, the effects of, of racism in the past, there are ongoing uh, acts of racism and discrimination that we are battling as well. So it's not even just a matter of saying, you know, slavery happened and these are the effects. There was Jim Crow. There was always something that kept on returning. And even now, uh, we are still faced with these things. So we're fighting the fight. Uh, there are many of our colleagues who are with us uh, fighting and fighting for Black communities as we, have, as we fight for the entire state. But at the same time, we're uh, balancing and we're making sure that we are doing everything we can to protect uh, our Black communities, Harlem, and communities that are similar to Harlem. So I thank you for this opportunity today. I hope that we can do more of this in the future. I know that as a unified front, we are more powerful, and uh, we want to continue to uh, fight to make sure that we are acting, we're using our power to uh, the best of our ability. These are just a sampling of topics that we wanted to bring to you. We're in Albany, far away from New York City, and sometimes people don't get to see. I encourage you to watch the hearings uh, and watch the sessions that do take place virtually. Uh, and when uh, city, the state opens up a little bit more, we can, you can come up there and visit us uh, in Albany. But I thought we could bring just a few things to you from your various legislators uh, talking to you this morning. And I know it's a short period of time, but I thank you so much for this opportunity. And I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Green uh, at this moment. Thank you. Good morning uh, to all. I'm most appreciative and grateful uh, to our elected officials who have taken the time from their busy schedules to come and to participate 
uh, in our Black History uh, program. We certainly want to uh, appreciatively applaud uh, our moderator and our own uh, State Senator Cordell Clear, uh, who has done a fantastic job. These have been some most uh, relevant questions. And uh, we have uh, received uh, great answers and great responses uh, from those who serve our community. Um, I want to thank all of them. I don't want to get in the name calling, uh, but I want to thank all of our elected officials uh, who I've worked with uh, over the years. Uh, I've made many trips to Albany. I've sat in their offices and met with their staff. Uh, members and stood by them um, in protest uh, lines and marches. And uh, they are uh, on the front line. And uh, I remember so vividly when uh, Robert, Brother Robert Jackson uh, made that long pilgrimage uh, to uh, Albany. I felt bad for him. I almost wanted to join him, but I knew I couldn't make that 150 miles. Uh, but we're grateful. Thank you to our, especially to our Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin, who we're so very proud of. We're very proud of all of our elected officials. So let's give a virtual hand clap of praise. I'm surrounded by an office filled with deacons and walking deacons who are in the process of becoming uh, deacons. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to have to do a little hazing this morning. Uh, so, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Washington Deacon, Deacon Bradley Howard. Uh, he's in law enforcement. He's going to start us off this morning. But we're grateful. Thank you, uh, Minister Evans, uh, Superintendent Evans, and uh, Co-Superintendent uh, Cooper. Thank you so so very much, and uh, to our young people. Uh, Jaden and Jewel, uh, don't they make us proud? Don't they make us proud? Uh, they are our reminders uh, that the future of people of color here uh, in New York City is in good hands. And uh, we have to embrace them. We have to love them. We have to nurture them. And uh, we have, we have a, a great group of young people uh, coming up now through our kingdom kids and our youth department and uh, they are the future uh, of our community and our church and so i'm grateful thank you so much uh, for being here with us today to god be the glory for the great things he has done i want you to join us uh, for our 9 30 a.m worship service this morning i'm going to be preaching a message entitled god is in control and uh, I want you to be blessed by that message today. God bless you and God keep you. I'll see you uh, in a few minutes. We praise God for um, our Senator Clear and to our pastor and to the Superintendent Evans and Superintendent Cooper. What an awesome experience on today that we've had the opportunity to share. Um, I think one of the things that stood out today in this presentation is that often we hear that we need those who will speak truth to power. And we heard that in order to speak truth to power, you have to know the truth. And today we've been uh, given information so we would know the truth. And we also want to share today that in order to operate in truth, you have to know Jesus for yourself. So on this morning and listening to all of the information that has been shared, we challenge you today. If you want to reclaim your royalty, it starts with knowing who Jesus is. It starts with a relationship. And so here at the Mount Nebo Church, you've experienced what we're about. We're about um, holistic ministry. We're about making sure that you know not only spiritually about the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, but how to journey through life with that you desire to be in relationship and reclaim your royalty. We invite you to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We invite you 
to know him for yourself, bro that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If you choose Jesus today, would you put your name in the chat box on Facebook, on Zoom? And we have staff members, our ministers, our deacons, they're watching, our teachers. We'll reach out to you. We'll love up on you. We'll walk you through the plan of salvation because our desire is that you would know Jesus for yourself. We pray that you've been encouraged today. God bless you in the hands of our superintendent, Cooper. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone this morning. All that have shared with us, we truly thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we will move forward with our giving. It is now time to give. And we do ask that you would give in support of the Christian education ministry here at the Mount Nebo Baptist Church. And we have several ways in which you can give. You can give by way of Givelify, downloading the app and look for Mount Nebo Baptist Church. You can give by way of Zelle, M-T-N-E-B-O-H at AOL.com. You can give by way of mail, U.S. Postal Service. You can mail your offering to the Mount Nebo Baptist Church. Our address is 1883 Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard, New York, New York, 10026. Or you can mail your donation to the church Tuesday through Friday. You can drop it at the church Tuesday through Friday between the hours of 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. Please, please give. At this time, we would ask if our Superintendent Evans would come and do our daily devotional readings for our next week's lesson. Next week, the week of February 28th through March 6th on Monday, our scripture is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11, prepare the way of the Lord. On Tuesday, our scripture, Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 10, being God's instrument. On Wednesday, Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19, God will provide for every need. On Thursday, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 15, and verses 21 through 31. Lift up your eyes to God. Friday, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Live freely, but responsibly. On Saturday, the scripture is Psalm 97. Light dawns for the righteous. And on Sunday, our lesson, Ezra, chapter one, verses one through eight, verses 11, and then chapter two, verses 64 through 70. Cyrus permits Jews to return home. Those are our readings for next week's lesson in preparation. At this time, we will have our announcements and upcoming events. Let us please remember that our restoration to elimination pledge campaign is underway and we're asking everyone that has not pledged and desire to do so, please act in faith and make the commitment. This is a corporate effort and we want everyone to be a part as we celebrate the victory as one. On this coming Wednesday, March 2nd, is our Bible enrichment at 6.45 p.m. We would ask that you would join us and invite someone else to share. We thank God for our ministerial team in sharing in our first social media event of the year. And it was held on last week via the Mount Nebo YouTube page. This is a monthly event. So please listen for the March event to be announced soon. On yesterday, Saturday, February 26th, our men's ministry, along with our Sidewalk Saturday outreach team, hosted a spring jacket giveaway. We thank God for outreach as an opportunity to show God's love and invite others to know Jesus and join the Mount Nebo family. Today, as we begin our return to the sanctuary, all leaders will be joining Pastor Green on site for church for our 9.30 a.m. worship. Then on next 
Sunday, the membership will be invited to join and additional details will follow. Please pay attention for further information regarding the membership return to the sanctuary. Our hotline is still available for prayer and resources on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We would ask that you would uh, remember those in need of prayer on our prayer list. And please, we'd like to add, which we just heard this morning, that our sister Bessie Harris suffered the loss of a niece. So please let us keep her and family in prayer as we go before God. Let us remember our pastor and his family always, all of those who stand in need of prayer. We pray for those that are affected by the current war in Ukraine and Russia, and only God can heal our land. And we pray that he will comfort those that suffer hurt and loss. Let us always remember to pray. Please join us for our 9.30 a.m. worship this morning on Facebook. We begin with our 9.25 countdown to worship. And worship begins promptly at 9.30 a.m. And we look to hear a word from our pastor who will be joined by the leadership team of the Mount Nebo Baptist Church this morning for 9.30 worship. At this time, we will have our closing and we ask if Sister Tarona Clark would prepare to recite our closing. Sister Tarona, yes. let the words of my I'm, mouth let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight be acceptable in my sight O oh Lord O oh Lord my strength my strength and my redeemer amen and my redeemer amen Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, and go amen. in peace. Join us for 930 worship. Thank you all. Amen.